Hello, welcome to Emotional Badass, where Moxie meets Mindful. I'm your host, Nikki Eisenhower, life coach and psychotherapist. And on today's episode, I'm discussing the self-discipline to heal hypervigilance and overthinking. Healing hypervigilance is an exercise in reparenting our inner psyche. And our inner psyche is what we mean when we say the inner child. We hear a whole lot about self-love and self-care when we're growing, when we're doing self-development work, when we're healing. But how about self-discipline? Now, discipline has a bad rap for recovering people. Just like conflict has a bad rap because of how we grew up. Dysfunction has an amazing way of becoming polar, meaning that if you're from a dysfunctional home, it is likely that you were raised much like I was, with too much authoritarianism, which is a whole lot of control issues in the adults. And this authoritarianism, this hyper-control over the children in such a household is often in the name of keeping the children safe, but it stifles. It's a whole lot of messaging that says, obey me. And that takes away someone's autonomy. It takes away someone's ability to ask questions and ponder to have their wheels turn in their mind so that their decision-making skills can grow. If a question is asked in this home, a question or a challenge, what's likely heard is because I said so, because I'm the adult. That's why. No real explanations, no real reasoning, just obeyable moments over teachable moments, which is why a lot of us have anxiety because we missed tenderness and guidance in some of these moments and we're left with a sense of confusion and shame because of the harshness of this authoritarian style. If I knocked over a glass of milk as a child, it was a flip out moment for my mom. And I heard things like, what's wrong with you? Oh, shit. Why did you do that? Anger, frustration, zero to 10 reaction. This gave me the impression That getting right in body and head, being a good person, meant that I needed to never make a mistake. Now, how the hell is anyone supposed to feel calm, centered, enough as a human being, as a person, with a set up expectation that you're never, ever, ever, ever able to get it wrong? And when you do, that you're supposed to feel bad. And you should have known better without anyone teaching you. What's healthy is to have a natural and curious relationship with mistakes so that we're able to grow into more knowing from healthy versus fearful or anxious experience. Parents that are more moderate understand how to hold this energy and guide us towards making choices, empowering us as we grow and develop. The other side of the pendulum is passive parenting. It's neglectful. It's more of a nothingness than a full control. Very different than the authoritarian style. This is a dynamic of too little care, too little attention, too little supervision. These kids knock over the milk and likely it just stays there because there's nobody there to say, hey, this is what you do. When you knock over a glass of milk, so it stays there. Or this child attempts instinctually to grab a towel and wipe it up. But a small child doesn't understand the difference between milk and water, that the water will dry, but the milk will get gross and sticky and attract bugs and rot. These kids grow up to often truly not be able to see what needs doing. 
They can't see how to take care of their own spaces and their own bodies. Often their existence is very messy externally and internally. There's no order. And often this gets labeled ADD or ADHD and depression. It And yes, it'll check every box of ADD or depression. This is learned. When we grow up in the absence of proper attention, it's difficult to know where to put attention, what to put it on, how to put attention on the right things to move our lives forward. When medicine is prescribed for such things, medicine can only attend to some symptoms that have developed because of these things. There's no medicine in the world that can help teach us how to order a room. There's no medicine that can work the mind muscle of focus the way that meditation can. And when we have such symptoms and grew up in such a way, we really do need to put effort and energy into focusing our mind muscles. Think about bodybuilders. Now, I'm not advocating anybody take steroids. Don't do that. But a lot of people use mental health medications, psychiatric medications, in this way. It would be like a bodybuilder taking steroids and then sitting on the sofa and staring at his muscles. That's not going to work. You don't just take the steroids to watch the muscles grow. You take the steroids to pump the muscles up as you work them out to better perform in those workouts. Many, many people use psychiatric medications in such a way. Well, I'm taking my meds and I talk about what sucks about my life every week or every other week with a therapist. Why isn't my life getting better? Why can't I focus? And it's right in that place where the diagnoses often become the excuses or the traps. We over-identify and believe this is who we are instead of what we learned. We believe we are just doomed to such an existence, to such symptoms, as if we're powerless and we have so much power. So in recovery of a dysfunctional childhood, there are kind of two camps in this way. Because of these poles, because, because of this polarization, the over-controlled and the under-supervised. The over-controlled people were over-disciplined. So they hear me mention something like self-discipline and they have an aversion or they brace to feel the low emotions like shame, anxiety, people-pleasing, trying to get it right so that they don't get in trouble. Because that was the flavor, if you will, of their over-discipline. The under-supervised people hear me say self-discipline. And because they were under-disciplined, they hear that word and think, F that. I'm still alive. I'm all right. My parents didn't discipline me and I don't want to discipline myself. That inner adolescent bucks that. I don't need that. Nobody's told me anything all my life. I don't need anybody to come in now and just tell me something, not somebody else and not myself, and really resist discipline. It's as if they have no muscles for discipline. And the authoritarian camp, they know how to do discipline, but they're terrified of it, bracing for shame. Discipline is not militant. Discipline is not critical. It's not harsh. It doesn't stifle. It doesn't limit. And it doesn't shame in a dysfunctional way. Good discipline is good medicine for this human experience. Lately, I've had Super Nanny Joe Frost on my mind. I think I've mentioned her in another episode. And I would put her in a similar category to Mr. Rogers. Television for all the crap. It's a powerful medium for the right spirited individuals. And there's no better way than to be shown. I can tell you and tell you and tell you over this mic. But over a video, I can show you. That's part of why I produce content in multiple mediums. Because each medium gives you something a little bit different. 
There are tons of Super Nanny episodes on YouTube or online. If you are a parent to children or know that you need to reparent your inner child, Joe Frost on television working with families is the single best example that I have to show you. What you'll see if you go check her out live in action is that discipline is kindness. Discipline is mature. Discipline is a boundary enforced. Many of you listening have already taken my boundaries course. We'll open up enrollment in the next few weeks. Discipline is a boundary enforced. Discipline teaches self-control and containment and is itself a vessel of patience when done well. Discipline must be followed through or it makes things worse. Because your inner child won't trust you if you're sloppy with your self-discipline. Those of you with perfectionism, watch that perfectionist here. You also don't have to be perfect with your discipline for it to be effective. Discipline is nuanced. Discipline is an empowerer. Proper, consistent discipline provides a sense of personal power from choice. Good discipline gives choices and helps someone step into their power. Resisting discipline is natural when you come from a dysfunctional home. Resisting discipline is natural no matter where you sit on the spectrum of dysfunction. Even if you came from one of the healthiest homes we can look at, you might still buck discipline. I don't think any of us go, oh, yeah, you know what I want? Discipline. It's not something that we crave. Our egos go, no, thank you very much. I'm out. I don't need that. I don't want that. I'm a grown up. Thanks. I'm not alone in sharing coming from a dysfunctional home and having a period of youth where I was buck wild in my rebellion. I needed to rebel against that authoritarianism, but that rebellion was too much of a pendulum swing because we don't know how to be grounded, centered in the middle ground when we come from dysfunction. We swing wildly and to heal We've got to understand, oh, I need to make the choice to keep getting off of this swing. And we need to notice when we get onto that swing and start that swinging process so we can help empower ourselves to stop it. The last thing I wanted for many, many years was any form of discipline. If you go watch a Super Nanny episode, you will see what happens when healthy discipline is enacted. You will see a repairing between parent and child. And when you do this work with yourself, with your inner child, you will see and feel a repairing within yourself. And it feels like connection internally. It feels grounding. It feels safer. It feels quieting. It feels calming. It feels nurturing. It feels respectful. Discipline really does help us get to a place where we can stop surviving and learn what it is to thrive. Good discipline is important on the healing journey. If you want this kind of blooming and joyous, healing, connected relationship with your own child or your inner child, I have three tasks for you to embrace and work on. And these tasks will help you quiet overthinking and hypervigilance through self-discipline over time. Here are three tasks that I have for you to embrace and practice. Number one is get clarity. And what does this take for an HSP or an empath? What does this mean? What can we do? Take some time to yourself to review and write your own ideas of tough love and soft love. Now, my mom was big on believing that she parented through tough love. My dad, my abuser, was the sweet, easygoing, soft love parent. I hear many highly sensitive people who've left narcissistic relationships with family members or with partnerships. 
And I often hear, oh, my, my ex did tough love, or my mom tried tough love, or my dad was all about the tough love. Well, people with narcissistic traits can't really do tough love, even if they tell you that that's what they're doing. To do tough love or to be firm appropriately, a human being must be willing and engaged in principles of patience, empathy, They must understand a child's age appropriateness. They must have reasonable expectations versus perfectionistic expectations. And narcissists don't do any of that very well because it takes high maturity and high empathy to be able to do those things very well. It takes learning and coming from a place of not thinking you already have it figured out and can just hammer your way through. You can watch Joe Frost on Super Nanny episodes, and this can help you view your childhood through a different lens as you witness healthy, firm, compassionate discipline in action as a learning tool. It will show you the good things that you got from your family of origin or the things that were lacking or weren't quite right. It can show you so much of exactly what you missed as a child, and what you can do now to give your inner child exactly what he or she needs to be able to grow her up with security. And at that point, we act out less and less. We stay stabilized even when life sends waves of chaos or stress or things not going our way. Number two, practice patience. We need to practice patience every single day if we want to be grounded, happy human beings. We must practice patience with ourself and with the unknown. I see highly sensitive people do this thing that I'm going to try to describe. It's as if they get one little piece of a puzzle. Let's use dating as an example, but it can be anything. You go on one date or you get one text message back and it's as if the highly sensitive person grabs that one puzzle piece because it's just one little puzzle piece and they smack it on the table and they look at it and they go, what is this picture? I must figure out this picture. They work their mind and they work their mind and they use their heart and they wonder and they wonder and they try to see it and they imagine and they get frustrated and they get exhausted and they spin on it and they spin on it and they overthink and overthink and overthink and figure it out and try to figure it out and try to figure it out. There's a whole way of being that doesn't involve trying so hard. What if you could allow life to be like pieces of a puzzle. Instead of trying to figure it out, can it be more like, ooh, that's a cool puzzle piece. I'm going to definitely collect more puzzle pieces. I can let this picture form. I don't have to figure it out. What if as each puzzle piece showed us more and more, we could just have wonder We could delight as the picture comes into focus, as we figure out what it is that we're seeing. So many of you out there think that the way to peace is figuring out that picture. You see how problematic that is? There are so many times in life where we just don't know. The picture hasn't formed yet. It's actually forming right now. And by trying to figure it out, I'm disrespecting myself I'm stressing myself out. I'm practicing the very thing I want to stop overthinking. I'm wearing my own self out. I'm being my own energy vampire. So we practice patience. We practice allowing these pieces of life, like a puzzle, to come to us. And we put them together with puzzle making energy, y'all. Like, ooh, maybe this fits here. Ooh, maybe this clicks in here. Ooh, yeah, I think the picture's forming. There's no desperation and there's no pressure. We can stop trying to figure it out. We can start trusting that we will naturally have it figured out as it unfolds, 
as the picture comes together, as the puzzle adds pieces. Number three, we allow feeling. Allow feeling. Sounds like the simplest thing in the world, doesn't it? I talk about it a lot. In modern society, it is one of the hardest things to get ourselves to sit down and do. We see very few people model actually doing it. We allow feeling of self and unknown. And what do I mean by allow feeling? This means that when you get that one singular puzzle piece, you can feel anxious if that's what you've felt most times in your life when you've gotten a puzzle piece. Or you can practice from a place of patience that that's just a puzzle piece. And at first, your feelings might get anxious. They might get squirrely. They might get squirmy. They might say, hey, we're supposed to do something right now. Aren't we supposed to be overthinking this? Aren't we supposed to be finding all the pieces? How am I going to be okay if I don't find all the pieces? I really need to figure this out. And you take a deep breath. And instead of trying to make meaning, I need to figure out the meaning of this picture. I need to know. Then I can get peaceful. Then I can be anxiety free. Then I'll be in thriving mode. We can allow the feeling instead of a story or a pressure to develop. The feeling might be, I don't know what to do with myself right now. Because when we stop overthinking, the truth is we don't know what the hell to do. Overthinking has been there like a dysfunctional friend. Every time we start to get quiet, every time we might just feel, because we might feel sadness, we might let go, we might cry, we might realize some things in our life that we don't really want to deal with, like boundaries that need to be set or people we've outgrown that we need to let go of or spaces where we need to fill with new friends, which means getting real brave, showing up for ourselves and risking. So in those spaces that we start to earn from our self-care, from our self-discipline, we can start saying to ourselves, stop, that's enough thinking we feel. And this is something that we can embrace and practice until this gets easy. Because it can get easy. It really can. Anything that we practice can get easier. Think about the first time you ever drove a car. And think about this week driving a car. That first week, it felt like, oh my gosh, too many things going on. I'm never going to get this. And now you're as good at driving as you are at walking. This is the part that is about starting to allow yourself to sit with some moments of thriving instead of surviving. If you sit still and your body wants to cry and you allow tears to flow from your face, I'm telling you that is thriving because for you in that moment, that is the season that you're in. And when you acknowledge it instead of fighting it, when you allow it instead of fighting it or smushing it or squirming away from it, you stop trying to survive it. You feel it because it's a feeling. It was meant to be felt. And then it moves on. And it might not move on instantly in the moment that you want it to. When you're allowing feeling, you are allowing thriving. It's only the perfectionist inside of you, combined with the idealism of the inner child, who believes that to be thriving, you can only be in happiness or joy or complete high vibe. Allow feeling instead of story. Allow feeling instead of that constant energy of trying to figure it out. This is what thriving is. It's learning how to just be not just with the good things in this life, but with the uncomfortable things. In this way, when you do this, it's like you're turning to yourself and saying, look, I've survived all these things. I can start using this wisdom to start approaching daily life differently. I get to thrive, damn it. We're going to practice this stuff, even though we don't want to. And this is why we must be disciplined and firm. And we must learn the nuanced difference between firm and loving and harsh and cruel. So to review, 
One, get clear on the dynamics that influenced you and what that looks like to be in the grounded middle when it comes to discipline with yourself so that you can balance out your life, give yourself what you missed out on and ring out and let go of what no longer serves you or never did. Two, remember that life is a constantly forming puzzle that continues to morph. Let the picture just take shape and unfold and show itself to you versus you trying so hard to figure out what's next or what's coming or what the full picture is when you just can't have the full picture yet. Practice patience with everything. It tells your nervous system that this moment is safe and activation of the nervous system isn't needed. And three, allow feeling, just feeling. What do we do with feelings? We feel them. It's the simplest thing and that's why we have overcomplicated it into the dirt. Let this be simple. Allow feeling. Now, before I end this episode, I want to tell you that I have an announcement to make. I am constantly, constantly being asked in person and emailed and in the boundaries course and in live streams and on Patreon for referrals because I cannot possibly work with everyone who wants to work with me. So what I have done is I have brought on my first soul care coach. This is someone that I have known more than 10 years. I have witnessed a lot of their journey and I am very, very excited. She has been a guest on this show before. She has a mental health background. She is a social worker and she is a very strong empath. Her name is Crystal Catalina. I currently am not taking new clients. You can sign up for my wait list, but you are welcome to come find us at emotionalbadass.com and book with Crystal right now. You are going to see her more and more on the show. You're going to see her in Patreon. She's going to be in the Boundaries course this coming year. And she's going to help me work on some new content, some new courses. And she's going to help me teach therapists out there how to become coaches, to have more joy, more fulfillment, more peace in your work, more permission to be the healer that you wanted to be when you sought out school. So I'm excited for what Crystal's going to add to my life and how she's going to help me and how she's going to serve you too. Now I know on the show, y'all have come to trust me. You have spent a lot of time with me. I'm very intimate with you on the show. Soon we'll release an episode where Crystal and I are chatting and just kind of hanging out with each other so that you can learn more about who she is, what she offers, what her strengths are as the healer in the healing chair. With Crystal, me, or any professional that you work with, know that it's part their education, part their background, but it's also part, how do you click? Do you have a calling to go work with that person? And I know this is a big topic because one of the episodes that has had the most downloads ever is our episode on how to find a healthy healer. So if you're interested, come check out Crystal Catalina at emotionalbadass.com, our, my first endorsed soul care coach. And you'll hear from her soon. One of the things that we do for our Patreon producers of the show is we give shout outs live on the air right here. I want to give some of those shout outs today. We truly, truly cannot do the show without you. Patreon people, y'all are why we do not have annoying, intrusive commercials on this podcast. Your support at Patreon helps us honor that. There are reasons why every podcast that you listen to and that you love has to get revenue. It does cost a lot of time and energy, resources, equipment, editing, keeping up with social media to run a successful podcast and a podcast that sounds really, really good to highly sensitive ears. When I say we can't do it without you, we cannot do it without you. I am so grateful for the support that you give me supporting you and the support that you give us to get this show out all over the world. I want to thank Sarah, Karen with a C, Melissa, Shaylee, Leon, Christy. Oh, it chokes me up every time, you guys. Lisa, Carol, 
Destiny with two beautiful E's. I want to thank Mary, Paula, Melissa, Lorraine, Tisha, Jamie, Mark, Aaron, another Mark, Bodie, and Trevor. I truly hope that there is something that helps you in this episode and all the episodes that we do that helps you hold yourself just with more light and love, more ease, maybe sometimes a little bit more sense of humor and self-respect and regard because you deserve it. There's so much that's hard out there in this world, but there's so much that's beautiful and lovely. When you do this work, you are intentionally inviting more of the loveliness and learning how to dial that up while we dial down what's a slog. Thank you for being on the planet with me doing this work. It gives me hope every single day. I'm an emotional badass. You're an emotional badass. And together we are where Moxie meets mindful. I will see y'all right here next week for another episode. Light and love and take care. Bye-bye.